All right. Thanks for coming, everybody. My name is Jacob Finlay. I'm the co-founder and former CEO, now executive chairman of Full Bay. And we're going to be talking about from Mad Men to Moneyball, how to win at shop management. And I'll talk about what that title means here in a minute. But first, let me quickly introduce myself. So I did not grow up in the transportation logistics or truck repair industry. Uh, I'm kind of, kind of an outsider. So I'm a CPA by trade. I started my career with uh, Deloitte and & Touche and um, actually planned on being an accounting professor eventually, but found myself with some pretty interesting clients in public accounting, Rockford, Fosgate, Fender, you know, as in Fender guitars, Taser, and so forth. They're in the Phoenix area. And you kind of get exposed to a lot of different industries, but one industry that I was never exposed to was truck repair, so fleet maintenance, truck repair. It wasn't until about 15 years ago um, that somebody, a friend of mine who had a shop, opened my eyes to this industry, which to most people out there, outside of the industry, most people have no idea that it even exists. They just assume, I think, that trucks get fixed at the same place that you know, people take their cars to get fixed, right? It's this hidden industry. So that planted a seed for me, and I ended up leaving public accounting and working in the electronic medical records space uh, for, for two successive uh, companies there. And we found a lot of you know, traction and success, but one thing that started to stand out to me was there's kind of a dirty secret in the electronic me medical records industry, and that is that most of these EMRs are built more, say more for billing people than for healing people. Right, and there's there's reasons for that. There's constraints around HIPAA, privacy, and so forth. Um, but there wasn't, at least at the time, a lot of oh, thanks, a lot of innovation going on. Right. To this day, there's still uh, there's still issues. Right. It's a great opportunity if somebody wants to go in and start a new EMR company. Go for it. I'm totally behind you. But I started to get this idea after being exposed to my, to truck repair. What what would happen if you were to build basically a medical record for trucks? So take some of the best ideas that aren't seeing the light of day in the EMR space and apply them to truck repair, to use software as a tool for healing uh, for trucks, right? And so I assembled a team and started working on it and got to the point where I quit my job and went to work in a truck shop for about a year to try to get some firsthand experience, some street credibility. And it was a bit of a risk. I had six kids at home at the time, and I was the sole provider. My wife stayed at home with the kids, and uh, she was 100% behind me and kind of went on to this journey. And after about a year in the shop, we had Full Bay about ready to start selling. Beta version, it was an early version. And uh, we haven't looked back from there, so we found a lot of success. So what is that, ha by the way, when the alarm went off, did you guys hear that? The last time I spoke at Matt's, I think it's three years ago, I don't think they did it in 2020, the exact same thing happened while I was speaking, then the power went out here and at the airport, and I don't know if anybody remembers that, but I was speaking at the time. I was kind of disappointed because I'd never eaten at KFC before, and on the way in from the airport, I saw one at the airport, and I was like, okay, the first time I eat at KFC will be in Kentucky. But then when I was headed back to the airport because of the power outage, their fryers were down, and so I was just worried that fate was controlling me not being able to eat at KFC. So we'll see if that works out. <clears throat> so what does my story or any of this have to do with the title of my speech, right? From Mad Men to Moneyball. Well, I'm gonna click this and hopefully we go to the next slide. We did not. Next slide, please. In the world, we have two different kind of pieces of information. I'm gonna try this again. There we go. Two different kinds of data. There's qualitative data and there's quantitative data, right? So qualitative data is descriptive in nature. It's, uh, yeah, you know, it's more subjective. You know, we talk about how some, something is an art 
we say something is an art until we identify what the underlying principles are to that thing, and then it becomes a science, right? That's where we go to quantitative. Quantitative data represents things that can be measured, quantified, and so forth, right? So the title of my speech is The Journey from Qualitative to Quantitative. So how many of you ever have ever watched the TV series Mad Men? This side, apparently you all grouped yourselves together. This side of the room, Mad Men, okay, this is great. So it's this TV series, I think it was on AMC, Don Draper, and it's about these marketing professionals who work for an agency on Madison Avenue in the early 60s, and they make decisions on marketing campaigns in the millions of dollars, and most of these, these decisions are based, made basically based on gut feeling, maybe some focus groups, but it's pretty much gut feeling. So that's how they were doing it back then. Moneyball, anybody seen Moneyball, the movie? Wow, perfect. So Moneyball, uh, it's about the Oakland A's, Brad Pitt is starring, and it's about this concept that traditionally in baseball, scouts would use some data, but mostly the same kind of qualitative assessment of players when they were recommending who should be drafted, who should be promoted, and so forth. And Billy Bean, the you know, general manager of the Oakland A's, gets the idea to start using quantitative metrics, saber metrics, basically looking at unused metrics to evaluate players that actually did predict wins. It turns out the traditional metrics didn't necessarily predict whether a team would win games, right? So they adopt these new metrics, and you can see the movie and see what happens. The A's end up doing really well based on this, and then the Red Sox adopt the same practices, and in 2004, they win the World Series using saber metrics, going from the qual qualitative to the quantitative approach. They break the curse of the Bambino, right, with this journey. So the title from Mad Men to Moneyball is, in order to survive in today's world, no matter what business you're in, but in truck repair particularly, we have to do things differently. What got us to where we are today will not get us to where we need to be tomorrow. And why not? Well, it's because companies like me are putting tools in the hands of your competitors across the street that allow them to see real-time statistics in their shop, allow them to see the kind of quantitative data that they need to take action on and that are, is going to make a big difference in their shop. Does that make sense? All right. So. I'm going to tell you what we're going to learn here. OK, perfect. Why we're going to, what we're going to learn, why we're going to learn it, and how to apply it. So first of all, I kind of told you the why, right? How it used to be in the shop is you could kind of shoot from the hip, right? Maybe get lax on authorizing repairs, because you know the customer will eventually authorize it anyway. So you just do the repair kind of on spec. But then what happens? You get into a position where not every repair does get authorized, right? So now you're in a situation where you have to haircut an invoice, you have an upset customer. That kind of thing doesn't work anymore. So you need the ability to quickly authorize repairs today, right? It's not enough to just kind of shoot from the hips. We actually see a lot of shops who judge their profitability by whether there's cash in the bank. You ever heard of people doing that before? Yeah? And you know why that's not true, right? Because you can increase the cash balance in the bank just by maybe not paying your payroll taxes for a couple quarters or not paying your vendors, right? So really cash in the bank doesn't tell you what you need to know. So repair now, authorize later. Um, looking at just cash in the bank, it's, it's not gonna cut it anymore, especially in the environment where we are with the parts shortage and technician shortage. You really have to make the shop as efficient as possible. So. The guy across the street with all these metrics, I'm going to call them diesel metrics. These are the metrics that actually matter, is going to beat you. He wants your customers. He wants your technicians. And to the extent that he can run his shop efficiently, there's a good chance that he's going to get them unless you stay with the times and get up and get on these, these metrics. OK. In this presentation, I'm going to give you as much as I can. So we, we learn a lot talking to thousands of truck shops around the US and Canada and now Australia. And we want to share that knowledge with you because we're not in the business of 
I guess, uh, selling our knowledge. We're in the business of trying to build the absolute best tools to run a shop possible. And so we just want to give you the knowledge that we have to, for the betterment of the industry. So I'm going to share as much as I can with you of what we learned here. And at the end, um, I'll make sure that you can download some of the key points. And I'm also going to recommend a, a sample shop financial plan that you can use to try to implement some of the things that I talk about. It's a spreadsheet you can download. It's pretty straightforward. Um, if I were able to share my screen up here, which we're constrained uh, with the medium, I could, sh I could show that to you. But if you go to our website, we've got some, uh, we've got some videos of like, what to do with the financial plan. OK, the next thing I wanted to talk to you about before we di dig into this is the different types of metrics that are out there. right? So there are lag metrics and there are lead metrics. So a lag metric is something that you want but you cannot directly influence. And a lead metric is something that you can directly influence that also predicts the lag measure. Okay, And I'll give you an example here. Well, actually. Let me show you this picture. It's kind of like this excavator, right? You have the bucket on the front. That's the thing you want to move, right? Because you want to dig, you know, dig a hole or whatever you're doing with it. That's your lag metric. But can you directly move that bucket? No, that's the whole point of heavy equipment. It's replacing a tiny little shovel, right? The only way to move that thing is by using the controls inside the cab. Those controls are your lead metrics. Does that make sense? So the thing you want to move is in the front. To get it to move, you have to pull the levers in the cab. So a really classic example of lead versus lag me metrics is losing weight. Anybody ever tried to do this before? Like gotten onto a plan? I know uh, I do all the time because I like to eat junk food and I need to overcome this. And we know with losing weight what the lag metric is, right? What is it? What was that? Well, that's, that's a good one, yeah. But it's just weight, right? You just step on the scale, and it tells you. It's really easy to get. And usually, lag metrics are really easy to find, right? Um, so what are the lead metrics? We know what the lead me metrics are for losing weight, right? What can you actually influence? Can you get up and lose five pounds before 7 AM? No. But can you get up and you know run three miles? Or can you choose? how many calories you consume, do, consume during the day? Yeah, you can. And we know that because we know that that influences your weight. Because if you burn more calories than you consume, you will lose weight. It's the law of thermodynamics, right? There's no getting around it. For the most part, that will happen. So diet and exercise are obviously the lead metrics. So what's the main lag metric in truck repair? What's the thing that you want? What's that bucket in front? What's the thing you really want in truck repair? Well, if you're an internal shop, if you're running it as a kind of a captive shop, you want it to run as efficiently as possible. If you're an external shop doing business with people, and by the way, it's pretty good business doing truck repair these days. If you can assemble a team of technicians into a shop, it's a great business to be in. It's hard, but you can make good money. And that is the lag metric, isn't it? It's profit, right? You want to make money. Unless you are a .org, a nonprofit truck repair shop, which uh, some people don't realize they're running necessarily, but usually the lag metric is profit. So the question becomes, what are the lead metrics? What levers can you actually pull in the shop that will impact your profit directly? And these are the things that you need to know real time, whereas in the past, maybe you didn't need to know this real time so much, and that is the guts of what I'm going to get into. So the next picture I have here, inside the cab, invoiced hours, SO hours, so basically the amount of time that your technicians are actually working on the job. Your labor rate, clocked hours, how many hours they're clocked in for work. Hiring technicians, your efficiency, utilization, your parts markup rate, these are all levers that you or your team can directly pull in the shop, which will directly impact your profit, if that makes sense. So if you want to increase your revenue and your profit, it's just a matter of pulling the levers on the right lead metrics, if that makes sense. OK, so 
first let's unpack the lag metrics. Let's talk about revenue and profit. It's, these are really the business level metrics that you get. How many of you run QuickBooks for your accounting? Anybody? By the way, how many of you are running an internal repair shop right now? For a fleet. For a fleet. And then how many of you are doing an external repair shop or plan to do one? Commercial repair shop. Okay. It's a handful of both. Okay. All right. So revenue and profit are the business level metrics. And this applies to your fleet too. It's the same concept. Usually for these, you're going to get them out of an accounting system. And I know what you're probably thinking. I already know what my revenue is for my shop. But most shops have a serious problem. And this was... I guess as a CPA, this was really surprising to me when I, really, when I started selling full base, seeing what shops were doing. And what most shops were doing was loading all of their revenue types into one bucket, right? It's just revenue. And they don't break out the revenue. They lump labor, parts, shop supplies, sublet, all of that stuff into just one number. And this causes serious problems with understanding how your shop is actually performing. Don't do this. To really peel the onion back, you have to break these out by what I'll call revenue type. Next slide. <laughs> Thanks. Revenue types. So labor, sublet parts, shop supplies. Don't just have one line. You need to break it out by this because these are essentially four different, and there could be more, right? I see shops, we actually recommend it if you want to get into it. They'll break out a fifth one for service truck revenue, right? You charge mileage and a call-out fee and so forth for the revenue side, and then, uh, then you track all the costs of running the service truck to that thing, and you can see, am I actually making money on my service trucks, right? And if you're not, raise your call-out fee, raise your mileage rate. But when you break out your revenue this way, it enables you to start to see what's going on because next, you also want to break out your, do I have a laser on here? No. Your cost of revenue. So notice there on the left, you have the revenue type, labor parts, sublet shop supplies, right? Your cost of revenue would be the cost of labor, cost of parts, cost of shop supplies. It's called the matching principle. So basically, the matching principle, it's a standard in accounting. You want to be able to identify what are the costs that I incurred to create that revenue specifically. And so when you're tracking your costs, you want to track the labor cost and then compare it to the labor revenue so you can see your specific labor profit. Does that make sense? Same thing for your cost of parts. Don't just lump everything into cost of goods sold. Cost of parts goes in there, sublet, shop supplies, and service truck, or whatever other line that you're tracking. And then you can see your specific gross profit. It's like the next layer down of the on onion. The matching principle. And then we actually show a guideline here these cost benchmarks that show you, once you're doing this, now you can start analyzing stuff like this, where 20% of your total, so this is, this is a service operation, right? Even if it's run internally, you can still uh, do this for uh, internal tracking. You take your total revenue, you shouldn't be spending any more than 20% of your total shop revenue on cost of labor, cost of paying the technicians to do the repair. 20% of total revenue, not just labor revenue, total revenue, 25% on parts. And once again, this is just a service operation. If you're selling parts over the counter, that doesn't count towards this. 25% of cost for parts, 30% for overhead, and then the remaining 25% should be your profit, which is nice. 25% profit is really nice. It's, it's doable. We see plenty of shops that do this. Is it hard to do? Yes. But it's what you should be aiming for to try to get to that 25%. Does that make sense? So percentage of your revenue. Well, what happens if your cost of labor is going above 20%? What do you do? What are you forced to do? What was that? Increase your labor rates. Who's facing cost increases right now? Anybody? Yeah. Or you could convert your for-profit operation into a .org, right, and just become a nonprofit shop. So which a lot of shops decide to do Indecision is decision. So if you decide not to increase your labor rates, you may be deciding to become a nonprofit organization, right? Which is not what you got into business to do, right? So you, you're forced to do it. And I think as a, as a rule of thumb, for every, call it, 
dollar an hour that you need to increase your labor, your, your, what you're paying your technicians, you need to increase what you charge. Don't shoot me, fleet owners. This is just, I think this, this applies uh, in every business. You need to increase what you charge your customers by $2 an hour. $1 to the tax, $2 an hour. Because remember, you have to cover your overhead. There's other expenses that need to be covered, if that makes sense. So to stay profitable and stay in business, that's the rule of thumb. Make sense? Don't be a martyr. Don't, don't uh, accept this. And the reason why this matters, there's many reasons this matters, but how many of you that have a shop are having a hard time finding technicians? Yeah, so there's many reasons for this. We all know about the skills gap and so forth, but technicians are a valuable commodity, and there are fewer technicians today than, than we want, right? So, like I said earlier, if you are able to assemble a team of technicians to do repair, you should be fairly compensated for this. And the technicians, in order to stick around, need to be fairly compensated too. It's a fair exchange of value, right? It's a win-win. And your customers, the fleets, need you to stay in business. They need you out there maintaining their vehicles and helping them avoid unscheduled downtime, right? Which, for a fleet, is the absolute number one worst thing to happen, right? an unscheduled breakdown. So it's okay to raise your rates, and they will absorb it, and they need to raise their rates too, and it goes around, but shop owners who are just trying to be nice and, and don't want to feel bad about raising rates are less likely to stay in business long term, and everyone suffers for that. So that's not a win-win situation. Does that make sense? So never feel bad about increasing your labor rates if you have to through the cost structure. The other thing is, the more all of us pay technicians more, it will invite more participants into the industry to become diesel technicians. So sometimes we talk about, you know, nobody wants to become a diesel technician because it's a dirty job, right, so on and so forth. But um, imagine if you were, say, a, a nurse, right? So think of the absolutely terrible things that nurses have to deal with during the day. It's actually much worse than being a diesel technician, right? And they're well compensated. Diesel techs, um, should be very well compensated for the skill set that they have, and it will encourage others to come into the market. It shouldn't be a, uh, uh, a low-wage profession. Does that make sense? The demand is there. We need the equipment maintained, and the, you know, the, worst, ma the worst maintenance, as maintenance on our equipment gets worse, the more dangerous it is for all of us to drive on the roads with this equipment, and for our families to be driving next to that truck right, that was not poorly maintained because there weren't enough technicians. See where I'm going with this? So society needs more diesel technicians. Does that make sense? So anyway. Okay, so these are, these are good targets and benchmarks to go after. By the way, um, if you were to model this on a financial plan, and let's say your shop has five technicians today, right? Model it with a 25% profit margin on there it's good money, you're making good money, and each additional technician that you add increases it even more. And look, the laws of supply and demand are gonna come on you. You may not be able to uh, maintain a 25% profit margin long term, but running a diesel repair shop can still be very profitable if you are tracking the right metrics. Okay. All of these metrics here get tracked in your accounting system, like QuickBooks. The metrics I'm about to talk about, the lead metrics, get typically tracked in a shop management system, which is a type of managerial accounting system. QuickBooks is like a financial accounting system. A system like Full Bay or other shop management systems, th those are managerial accounting systems meant to track your lead metrics. Okay. Now, before I show you what I'm about to show you, oh, go back, oh shoot. I just wanna say a word about compassion, right? So. Sometimes technicians and others, when you implement a new system, may feel like Big Brother is now watching. Or sometimes you might get uh, a tendency in an organization to focus on the numbers instead of the, the person, the human. So just keep in mind, as you shift to tracking metrics and, and doing things real time and so forth, it shouldn't feel like that. And in fact, Studies show that there's a positive correlation between accountability and morale. 
a positive correlation. People want to be held accountable. They want to be part of a winning team, a winning game. And in fact, if you remember the book, The Adventures of Tom Sawyer, which sometimes gets spanned, I guess, but if you've read it, there's this part of the book where Tom Sawyer gets his friends to whitewash the fence for him, right? There's actually a psychology term based on that called the Sawyer effect. It's the ability to get people to do things because they want to do them for the intrinsic reward of doing that. That's why we play games, right? We get together and play a game, not because we're getting paid to play the game, but because we enjoy it, right? And there's a lot, of, a lot in life that can be enjoyed in that way, even work, so where you kind of make a game of it. And I, I would encourage you to go that direction instead of the big brother looking down on people type direction, if that makes sense. So what I'm gonna show you is examples of an owner scoreboard, manager scoreboard, and a technician scoreboard showing lag or lead metrics. So here we go. Here's the first one. Owner scoreboard. So you are the owner of a truck repair shop, and I just realized there's a screen right down here, so I don't have to keep looking up. This is great. So you see the lag metrics up at the top. We already covered those. And then down below, we have our lead metrics. So these are the things that actually move the needle on the stuff up above. So in this example, if you look in the bottom right, SO hours, that is the amount of time that your technician so far, let's say this snapshot was taken in the middle of a day in a truck repair shop. That's how many hours the technicians have actually spent working on jobs. So in this example, we've got 10 technicians. So they're halfway through the day. So on average, they spent about three and a half hours working on jobs, and we're halfway through the day. 35 hours divided by 10 technicians is about three and a half hours. You guys with me? Next one, clocked hours in the middle. That's how many hours the technicians have been clocked in. So it's the middle of the day, they've all been clocked in for four hours on average. Does that make sense? And then invoiced hours, that's how many hours we've actually invoiced to the customer or completed that are going to be invoiced, so 43.8. So those are, those are important. Efficiency right there, the 109, is this is a really important metric. And we usually when shops come in onto our platform, they're running at 75% efficiency or below. Do you guys understand efficiency? I mean, it's invoiced hours divided by clocked hours. So how many hours we build divided by how, much we're how many hours we're paying the technicians for. So if you're running a shop, you're paying technicians 40 hours a week, well, how many hours are you actually billing? That's, that's what efficiency is answering the question of. So it's actually really easy to calculate. In this example, it's 109%, which is just the 43.8 divided by 40, right? And then utilization is similar, it's how many hours that we've been working on the jobs, so the 35 divided by the clocked hours. So 88% is actually a pretty good figure. You can't expect your techs to be working 100% of the time they're on the clock, right? Because there's bathroom breaks, meetings. But, so 88% is pretty good. 85 to 90% is as a stellar utilization number. It's amazing how low that gets in some shops. And there are certain things that you can do to make them more efficient. For example, every time you require a technician to leave the bay to do something, you basically lose a quarter hour of work, of billable time, which is about 3% of their day. So anything you can do to keep the tech in the bay and supplied with what they need, instead of having to leave the bay to go get a part or go stand in line at the service writer's or service manager's desk, you're gonna become more efficient, if that makes sense. So those are some metrics that you would want to see on an owner scoreboard. Um, now I'm gonna show you a manager scoreboard. A service manager or whoever wears that hat, and in smaller shops you might have one person wearing multiple hats. hats. Maybe they're doing the service and the parts or whatever. In bigger shops you might have many people wearing the same hat, being the service manager. But in this example, let's just say there's a service manager, this is their scoreboard. You wanna hold your service manager accountable for invoice hours, right? and efficiency. You wanna make sure that they're keeping the technicians fed with work. They're basically the quarterback of the shop, if that makes sense. And in this scoreboard, they have those really important metrics up at the top that they're being held accountable for. But down here, as we come to the bottom, you can see the lead metrics that actually impact efficiency and utilization. I'm just gonna walk you through these. So 
Let's start at the bottom right here. You see the scheduled hours? So these are all the technicians that we have working for the shop. It's the 10 technicians, right? And I can see here that I'm halfway through the day, so we have four hours left in the day. So we have 40 scheduled hours left today to do something with. It's like our raw materials, if that makes sense. And I can actually see for these technicians who's clocked into work but not working on anything. So they're making money, but the shop's not making any money. They have a red dot. The ones that are clocked into work, but maybe they're in a meeting or something are yellow. And the, then the green ones are making the shop money. They're clocked into work and they're on a job. Does that make sense? So there's my raw material. So as a service manager, I need to know exactly who I've got to work with and how much capacity that they have. You guys with me? Moving over, my goal here is to get as many authorized hours as I can. So we talked about the importance of authorizing jobs before we work on them. So get jo as you authorize estimates and jobs, the number there will go up. So the number of hours will go up. And then as the technicians work on those jobs, it, they're gonna move over to work in progress, that 43 in the middle, and then completed and then invoiced. So you need to keep that up. You never want authorized plus work in progress to be less than what you have scheduled for the day because that means you don't have work for the technicians, if you guys follow. So the question becomes, how do I keep that authorized hours number up? And that's what these five boxes are at the bottom. They're five examples of the type of business that you can bring into the authorized hours. Just start with PMs. Tracking preventive maintenance for customers is the absolute ideal way to run an independent repair shop because most fleets out there do not have the manpower internally to track preventive maintenance on their own thoroughly and do a good job. Some do, some do a good job of it, but most don't. And so it's one of the key value added services that an independent repair shop can provide to a fleet. And it's actually very good because you track their PMs, you can go proactively do them. Maybe you can go to their lot at night and line up 10 trucks and knock out all the wet services at once. Um, it actually becomes a highly efficient type of activity. And then by nature of that, you're gonna find other things that are wrong with the trucks, which you can then present to the customer on an estimate and ask them, hey, do you want us to do this? They can say yes or no, but typically fleets are very grateful for this because you might find something that otherwise would have caused their truck to go down, if that makes sense. So it's a win-win. The shop makes more money by tracking preventive maintenance, and the fleet makes more money by having fewer unscheduled downtimes. And the public makes not, not more money, but less people die on the roads from poorly maintained trucks. So everybody wins, it's a great thing. So running a good PM program for your customers is going to give you hours to work that can then be authorized and put into the authorized hours bucket. If that makes sense, right? I'm gonna move from the left to the right. So PMs, repair requests, that's somebody calls up the shop or they, they're your existing customer and you have a portal or something and they request a repair. That's an unscheduled thing. That's gonna provide you stuff as well. And we actually, um, well, I'll get to that. The next thing is estimates. A lot of times people will call up the shop and they ask you to do something and they never end up doing it. So you just save that as an estimate. Well, when things are slow at the shop, that's a really good pool to dip into. So you can call up this customer and uh, basically say, hey, look, we've got some time. Do you want us to knock this stuff out for you? Does that make sense? That's a nice pool. Next one, intake inspections. Um, I can't remember the percentage, but uh, I think 20 to 25% of shops do not charge for diagnosis when they're seeing a truck for the first time. Yeah, that's right. Charging for Diag is an important fair exchange of value between the shop and the customer because you're putting a technician on the diagnosis activity, right? Um, and th that technician needs to be paid, right? You don't wanna just give that away. What's nice about the Diag is that you can also perform a quick inspection of the vehicle and once again, see if you can find anything else that's wrong with the truck that could then go on to the estimate as well in addition to whatever the original complaint was. So intake inspe inspections are a source. And then finally, um, whenever the you know, customer declines a repair, you wanna keep track of that stuff, whether it was from one of those intake inspections or whatever, keep track of it in a pool of pending repairs. So once again, when things are slow, you can go back to that and bring in business. This is the job of the service manager to keep track of all this. Hopefully they have a good system to do it and to keep that authorized hours number up. Does that make sense? 
that is a lever that they can pull. Okay. So that's an example of a manager scoreboard. What about a technician? Well, the technician doesn't need to see all of that. It's need to know, right? Maybe you, maybe you want to share all your profitability numbers with the tech, maybe not. That's up to you, but for, their, for actually doing their job, they can have a scoreboard. It's slightly different. Um, typically, we're showing invoiced hours in the bottom left, but typically that would be completed hours. We let the tech get the satisfaction of completing a job right away. But in this day and age, the tools are available to give the technician and the service manager real-time information on efficiency. And you should be giving it to them. And uh, the guys across the street probably are on our platform and are already, already doing this. What about the parts side? So here's an example scoreboard for parts where you can track average markup. That metric that I showed you in the middle is the 24%. That's your cost of parts divided by total revenue. Help your parts team be part of this process and be held accountable for keeping these costs in line. Some more metrics that you can track here. Okay. So, in order for your shop to go from Mad Men to Moneyball, here's some quick takeaways. Start breaking out your revenue by type. So talk to your accountant and have them start doing this now because you will get an immediate benefit to this. Implement scoreboards to track your lead metrics. This is a winnable game, and there are systems out there available to do this and to help you, help you do this. Use a financial plan to set annual goals. So how many of you do an annual planning process for your business, annual financial planning process? A couple, okay, so about 20%. This is something that, I know I'm a CPA, so everything is finance and accounting, right? But accounting is the language of business. So if you, if you travel to Spain, you're gonna have a better experience if you speak Spanish, right? It's just better. There's a way to get by, and, and you don't necessarily need to, but you're definitely gonna have a deeper experience and, uh, and have a better time. The same goes for business. Accounting's kind of boring, sure, but it is the language of business. You're gonna do much better in business embracing accounting and learning enough to be dangerous. One of the things that you need to be doing, if you're not already, is doing an annual planning process where you basically say, look, here's what, here, here is what we're gonna to try to do this year, month by month. And what we have on, if you go to fullbay.com forward slash diesel metrics, you can download a sample financial plan. It's just, it's a simple spreadsheet. I made it, and actually, no, this one our director of finance made, but we made it together. You can make these things, they're not super complicated, and uh, we, we give you a template. Basically, you can go in, and all these metrics that I just walked you through, you can put in, well, what if I changed my labor rate from 95 to $100 an hour? Or what if I paid my techs five, $10 an hour more? What would be the impact? And plan this out. What if I went from five to seven techs by the end of the year? Does that make sense? You can see exactly what impact it would have. When I would, in the early days with Full Bay, when I was selling and I would uh, get just a few pieces of information from a shop that I was talking to, then I would key it into the financial plan that I had kind of off screen, and I could tell them how much money they were making and what their revenue was, even though they hadn't told me their revenue or their profit. It was uncanny. The reality is there's just a few key inputs that are required to be able to do this. That's the good news. And with this spreadsheet, it's free. Um, you can just go download it. You can do this too. And then it gives you the ability to identify, well, what levers can we pull this year to make the kind of impact on profit that we want to make? We want to make a lot of money, right? So this gives you the, the key. Does this make sense? You guys want to make money, right? That's the key. I mean. We also wanna have a great place to work and a great working environment. The same thing helps with that, right? The last thing is, if you do an annual planning process, it's important that every quarter you, you meet up and evaluate your goals, evaluate your progress on your goals, and make 90-day goals at a time, if that makes sense. So maybe, and by the way, I recommend when you do your financial planning not to make more than two or three goals for the business. Uh, because research shows that you can't accomplish more than that with quality. There's a great book, uh, a couple of great books 
uh, that cover what I'm talking about. One of them is The Four Disciplines of Execution. This comes from Franklin Covey. Another one is called Traction by Gina Wickman. There's a picture of a tire on the front, so it, it's applicable. So it's actually a really good book for any business. A lot of tech companies use that book. So embrace some kind of methodology, right, for doing an annual planning process, setting goals, and then every week, get together with your leadership team or with the shop, hold a toolbox meeting, and review how you're doing on your metrics and your goals. Review the lead metrics. Congratulate the technicians that had great efficiency. Consider implementing a, an efficiency bonus or some sort of commission plan where the technician's interests are aligned with the shop in terms of increasing the number of invoice hours, if that makes sense. So those would be my recommendations uh, on takeaways. And at this point, if anybody has any questions, I'm happy to answer them. Really appreciate your time and attention and, and being here. Yeah, thanks. Thank you. <laughs> yeah, please. Do we have an ERP? Does Fullway have an ERP integration? Yeah, so we have an API that uh, where middleware can be built. Uh, we have existing baked in integrations with some ERPs. Which one are you? We can talk after. Yeah. Or talk to Cole over here. He's got the full list. Yeah. Any other questions? Anybody thinking of starting a shop? And you're not sure if you want to do it? You guys are. Yeah, I mean, it's hard. It's hard to run, but um, it, it can be very rewarding. And it really, I think, it's too bad that it's too bad that this industry doesn't have a higher profile. It's too bad that I had to like accidentally learn about it and that it wasn't just common knowledge, truck repair, because of the impact that truck repair has on everybody out there. Like I mentioned, highway safety. So every day we know this is 2019 data and we know it actually got worse in 2020 even though everybody was staying at home. Fatalities spiked in 2020 on, on highway. But we know based on 2019 data that 11 people a, d a day die in uh, accidents involving heavy-duty vehicles. And two of those are drivers that die, and this is not counting injuries and dis disabilities and everything. 11 a day, two drivers a day, and f about four of those are uh, likely due to poor maintenance of the vehicles every single day. Yesterday, four people died. Today, four people will die. Tomorrow, four people will die. These are like random people. It's our family members. So I believe in the zero fatalities goal, that zero is the only acceptable goal. And maybe, you know, weather and other uh, things uh, are unavoidable. Uh, collision avoidance systems, obviously, will cut that number down from 11. But that four fatality number, we can all make an impact on by doing a better job tracking PMs, inspecting vehicles, and making sure that they're well maintained on the highway. And as a shop, you'll make more money. Your fleet customers will make more money, and fewer people will die. It's a great mission, massive public benefit. So I thank you for your impact on the industry, and let's all go out there and maintain vehicles better. It's a great business to be in. Um, it, 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 is it hard? Yes, but it's benefiting everybody. So thanks for your time, everybody. Thank you.